This is the capital asset pricing model, or CAPM for all you finance people out there. It was created in the 1950s by this guy, William Sharp, who eventually won a Nobel Prize in the 90s for that. It looks pretty complicated, but it, it isn't. But today we're not going to use it to price assets. We're actually going to look at the components of it and try and use it to make sense of retirement. Three things about retirement. Number one is how to deal with things when they don't go as expected as it relates to our investment portfolio. The second is the fundamental trade-off that you have to make when investing in retirement and the number one mistake to never make. And then three, understand what you're getting paid for when you're making investment decisions. We don't want to be like this fella here, digging holes in the middle of nowhere and expecting to get paid. No one's going to pay him. So that's what we'll cover today. Go ahead and click off now if you've got everything. But if you want to hear more, stick around. The first term in the CAPM formula is expected return. And it begs a question, what should we expect our investments to return in retirement? During the Berkshire Hathaway annual shareholder meeting, Warren and Charlie talk about this a lot, expectations and their importance as investors. Warren says one of the number one strengths you can have as an, as an investor is to lower your expectations. Charlie sometimes jokes, that's how we got married. She lowered her expectations. So for five seconds, think about the last time something didn't go quite according to how you thought it was gonna go. Close your eyes if you have to. What will you do when X doesn't happen like you thought it would? Like maybe you went across town and drove a long time and bought and paid for an extra sauce and it wasn't in the bag. Or this past summer when you were working from home and your neighbor decided to start celebrating our independence by lighting off fireworks three weeks early. How do you respond in those situations? And similarly, now with the markets since COVID, being on a historic run, unless you were invested in tech in, in 2022, how do you expect your portfolio to do if you're going to retire this year, next year? And what are you going to do if it doesn't meet those expectations? But here's the problem. Everyone knows the right things to say when it comes to the stock market. Time in the market beats time in the market. The only people who get hurt on a roller coaster are the ones who jump off halfway through. We all kind of know just to say that. Yeah, so it's really easy to say those trite sayings. To live through it is a different thing entirely. When you're young, you have no money, and then by the time you're close to retirement, the idea is, is that you have a ton of money, and this exponential growth is not natural to humans. We don't think in exponential terms. We think linearly, like things are just going to get incrementally better over time, but it doesn't happen that way. And when you're 15, 10, 5 years out from retirement, wealth really starts to accumulate very quickly just due to this exponential nature of things. So if you have a 20% loss in your portfolio, when you're 30, you have basically no money relative and a 20% loss of nothing is basically nothing. When you have a 20% loss, when you're close to retirement, it's a bigger loss than what you paid for your first house. So if you don't prepare yourself mentally you are at risk of making a mistake that will permanently damage your retirement. So now I want to talk about the trade-off that everyone has to make when investing in retirement. To do that, we're going to look at the risk-free rate term in the CAPM formula. In the United States, that's the Fed funds rate. It's the rate at which banks can loan and borrow money from each other. Right now, that is set at just under 4%. It's a range. It's always a range. But in order to be successful investing in retirement, we have to at least achieve this. Otherwise, our assets are going to be more similar to an ice cube, just slowly melting over time due to inflation. So there are several ways we can achieve earning this risk-free return. I've listed several of them here. Some of them get closer to it than others, but all of them are going to get you closer than just leaving your money uh, stuffed in a uh, coffee can in the backyard or under your mattress. But the fundamental trade-off that we have to make is is we have to decide what is our goal is it to earn this risk-free rate of return or do we need to earn a higher rate of return than that and how are we going to do that the biggest mistake that i see is not defining what the rate is actually going to be that is going to allow you to achieve your goals because a lot of people just simply say i need more <laughs> from this decision about how to allocate your portfolio you have to have a certain amount in the, the risk-free asset 
and a certain amount in the risky assets. And if you make a decision with a proper framework and you have a reason for why you're doing what you're doing, you can understand the consequences when things don't go according to plan and then you can make adjustments from there. But if you haven't thought through this in a thoughtful way, you're going to end up somewhere on this continuum. So zero to one here and then beyond one, this is the, the how much beta you have in your portfolio. So if you have zero beta, beta means you have all of your money in the risk-free asset, no market risk. And if you have 100% uh, in the risky asset, that means your beta is at one. Um, you can go beyond this and have a leveraged portfolio by um, borrowing money and investing in the risky asset. That's not a common thing and it's very risky to do but you're gonna end up somewhere on here. And if you're taking too much risk and you don't really know why or have a reason behind it, you're gonna be opening yourself up to making a mistake because oftentimes when there's bad news in the market, a lot of other bad stuff is happening in the world and it's an emotionally trying time. So if you make a bad decision and sell, uh, it usually wasn't based on anything except emotion. So that's what this this uh, this term comes into play. This is the equity risk premium. That's going to be how much of a premium we should expect to earn in stocks versus bonds. And the reason why we get paid for that is because the stock market is volatile place and it's hard to own them because we can see 20% dips regularly. So that's the explanation of this page. On the next one, we'll talk about what is the makeup of this return on the market um, term and the difference between beta and alpha. So finally, I just wanted to cover the difference between beta and alpha. Beta in the framework of the capital asset pricing model, you can get paid for. Alpha is idiosyncratic risk, which is just a fancy way of saying company specific risk. So the risk that a company will not be competitive in its market, it'll get disrupted, something will happen internally, that kind of risk is not compensated broadly in the capital uh, asset pricing model. So that's to say you can only really expect returns in this framework if you just invest in the broad market. And when we learned about it in investment classes, a broadly diversified portfolio usually starts somewhere about 20 individual stocks, 20 or 25 individual stocks. That's when they say the math, it kind of works out that you've diversified your risk across enough companies. Now you have to probably diversify across industries and what sort of risks you're taking in the market. Um, that's kind of a baseline. So one way you might determine if you're taking beta or alpha risk is if you're in actively managed or um, passively managed funds. If you're in actively managed funds, you'll frequently hear something like this. In light of current recent economic trends, our, uh, our portfolio of high quality equities has underperformed the broader market as the current environment favors equity belonging to highly cyclical, lower quality businesses. We remain constructive and view our portfolio as well positioned for the current cycle. All that means is just Wall Street banker talk for we underperformed our benchmarks, but we think our portfolio will do well going forward. Uh, and you'll hear that quite often. Um, and that leaves you with a decision point, right? It's, hey, do I believe in this manager? Do I want to stick with them? And, and do I think they can deliver alpha in the future? Uh, or do I find someone else, maybe another actively managed person? They're likely to just say AI at this point if you're in this boat. Uh, or you can just go um, in, in a passively managed direction and, and just try and own the market. So everyone's got their own style of how they like to invest. But uh, I hope that's helpful. And subscribe for more retirement planning content. See ya.